as the author of Educated, the exquisitely rendered memoir that earned you acknowledgement as one of Time's 100 most influ influential people of 2019, you shared the extraordinary experiences that led to your transformation. From a child of tightly constricted horizons to a distinguished scholar and citizen of the world, in recording this raw, compassionate history of love, loss, and self-discovery, you called upon the qualities that propelled your journey, an uncommon intelligence, emotional insight, resilience, and courage. In recognition of your searching and unbounded intellect, open-hearted humanity, and superb gift for inspirational storytelling, Northeastern University is pleased to bestow upon you the honorary degree, Doctor of Humane Letters. Doctor, Doctor, Tara Westover. Tara. box. Hello, good morning. How are we feeling? It's pretty good? That's not too bad, actually. You're definitely still awake. <laughs> President Aoun, members of the board, faculty, staff, and of course, all of you graduates. It is an honor to be with you this morning to celebrate this milestone, this kind of huge achievement. For you graduates, it's going to be the accumulation of several years of hard work. For your parents, it's a celebration of work that's been put in for your whole lives, maybe even from before your lives. So I know you've thanked them already, but I'm going to have you thank them again, but I have a request. All the flags have to wave because they're really beautiful. First, I'd just like to say that my being awarded this degree for a few minutes of public speaking in no way diminishes the many years of very hard work that you had to do to get yours. Actually, I haven't ever given a commencement speech before. In fact, this is the largest crowd that I've ever spoken to by probably about 10 times. <laughs> here. Uh, so I was a little tense about that. And I'm not that much older than you, maybe maybe 10 years. Um, this is kind of a scary thing. So what I did is I looked up last year's commencement speaker to see how I would measure up. Now I'm a published author with a book on the New York Times, so I thought, oh, I thought I'd be pretty good. I thought, I'll, I'll match up pretty well and make me feel better. Well, here's what I found. Uh, last year's speaker was an Emmy-nominated actor, which is okay, I thought that was okay. Uh, but then I kept reading. Uh, she's also a sprinter who's broken several world records. Wait for it. She's also a double below-the-knee amputee, there's more, who pioneered the technology for her own prosthesis which is now the international standard for prosthetics. <laughs> Put a bigger box. Wow. I would also casually mention that she's a runway model and was recently inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame. <laughs> yeah, if I were going to tailor make a nightmare act to follow, uh, it might be her. Anyway, in contrast, I'm not a model. Uh, I'm, I've overcome no major surgeries, and I have developed no technologies that will help other people. <laughs> I remember that back then I was an avid Facebook user, and that like everyone, when the ceremony ended, I uploaded some photos to my page. 
Specifically, I uploaded three photos. One of me standing alone in a cap and gown, and another of me standing with my mother. And the third photo was of me standing with my mother and my father. There was nothing unusual about those photos. In them we were smiling or near enough to it. I was just another happy graduate, full of promise, standing next to my happy parents. But this was a fiction, and I knew it. In fact, it was because the photos were untrue, and not in spite of it, that I wanted them online. Because they showed my life the way I wanted it to be, rather than the way that it was. Here are four things that I remember about that day. Four things that you can't see in the photos, but that tell the real story. Number one, but it was my first graduation ceremony. Unlike a lot of my classmates, I had neither a high school diploma nor a GED, and I have two PhDs, but I never managed to get a high school degree or a diploma. And the reason for that is I've been raised in the mountains of Idaho by survivalist parents who had a particular set of beliefs that meant I was never allowed to go to school. Sort of the equivalent of a kindergarten dropout. Uh, it was a miracle, frankly, that I made it to that university at all, uh, let alone that I was able to leave it with a degree. Number two, that although I was graduating from a Mormon university, I no longer believed in Mormonism. All of my senior year, I had struggled to hold on to the beliefs of my childhood, to the faith that I'd been raised with, that I shared with my parents, as well as with every single person that I cared about, every brother, sister, aunt, uncle, cousin. I was, at the moment I walked across that stage, still wondering what that loss of faith would mean. Could I even be a good person without my faith? It seems strange to me now, but I really did think that without Mormonism, I might turn out to be an ass. Number three, I was alone. Although my parents are standing next to me in the picture, they had not been at the graduation ceremony. At least I'm, I'm pretty sure they weren't there. I quarreled with my father a few weeks before over some part of his ideology, and he had declared to me that he wasn't coming. That morning, he changed his mind, and he and my mother raced down from Idaho. But they were too late. They missed the ceremony. And in fact, they were only there for the photo. Number four, my apartment was empty. I was up all of the night before, packing everything I owned either into boxes for storage or into suitcase, which now sat by the back door. I was leaving that night for the University of Cambridge in England, which is a country that I knew very little about. Thinking over those four things, I don't think there was any part of my life that I felt secure in or proud of. The prospect of Cambridge frankly terrified me. I'd grown up in a junkyard. I didn't feel particularly like I belonged in that grand place. Faith was the rock I'd built my life on, and now that rock was turning to sand before my eyes. My family, was a tangle of love and radicalism and what I now suspect was mental illness. The love was real, but so were the other things, and I did not yet know how I was going to navigate them. But that was who I was, but that is not who I uploaded to Facebook. I uploaded a happy woman, a woman who was all joy and smiles, who was fun, even though I was terrified, even though I spent most of that day just trying to get through it, just wishing that it was over. Something strange happened in the weeks and the years that followed my own graduation, something kind of bizarre, which is 
that I came to think of my graduation photos as my graduation. I came to identify more with the woman in those pictures than I did with my actual self. We humans have always struggled with two identities. There's always been a difference between who we are when we're alone and who we are when we're with other people. But now we seem to have a third identity, a third self, this virtual avatar that we create and share with the world. For most people, sharing themselves online, what that means is putting up a carefully curated identity that exaggerates some qualities while repressing others that they've decided are undesirable. Online, no one has acne or dark circles or a temper. No one washes dishes or does laundry or scrubs toilets. Mostly we brunch. That's <laughs> mostly what we do. And we take exotic, rarefied vacations. We pet sea turtles, we throw ourselves from airplanes. They're beautiful, unblemished lives. But sometimes I think that when we deny what is worst about ourselves, we also deny what is best. We repress our ignorance, and thus we deny our capacity to learn. We repress our faults, and thus we deny our capacity to change. We forget that it is our flawed human self, not our avatar, who creates things and reconsiders and forgives and shows mercy. But ultimately, I think, the real problem, as the writer Zadie Smith has pointed out, is that sharing a self is not the same thing as having a self. Your avatar isn't real. It's a projection. It's not terribly far from a lie. And like most lies that we tell, the real danger isn't that others will believe it, but that we will come to believe it ourselves. That we'll come to identify more with our virtual self, who looks so beguiling in photographs. His life is bright and free and literally filtered. In this way, we become alien to ourselves. Who is this person who spends so much time studying, washing dishes, taking care of grandma? This is not how I see myself. I learned at my own graduation that over-identifying with your idealized self is a deeply alienating experience. It's a form of self-rejection. Because what you're saying to yourself is, I'm not good enough the way I am. So today, I would like to pause for just a moment to appreciate the parts of you that you don't put online. In fact, I would like to mount a rigorous defense of them, of your boring, internal, book reading, dishwashing, thought having life. Of the parts of you that can't be captured by any technology, it's a concept that I'm going to call the un-Instagrammable self. Here's something I truly believe. Everything of any significance that you will do in your life will be done by your un-Instagrammable self. It is, for example, your un-Instagrammable self who's graduating today. I say that with confidence because I have yet to see a Facebook or Instagram account which is devoted to photos of someone studying, or attending lectures, or writing essays. There's probably one, but there's one of everything. <laughs> All of the most substantive experiences that you will have in your life will be had by the boorish slob you try to edit out of existence. The you who falls in love at your dingy entry-level job will not be the glamorous and airbrushed you who will appear in your wedding photos. <laughs> Parenting will be nothing like you will represent it to be online. For one thing, there will be a lot more actual shit <laughs> than you will ever post on Instagram. 
There will be sleep deprivation and petty standoffs and moments of self-doubt. But the moments of love and tenderness and belonging will touch you more deeply than anything you will find in the virtual world. You will look wonderful in the photos you will post of you and your children. You will look wonderful because you will make sure that you look wonderful and you will delete the ones in which you look harassed and sleep deprived. Maybe because your five-year-old woke up screaming from a nightmare at 3 a.m. You will not look wonderful as you crouch on your hall floor in stretched out pajama pants and nestle your child back to sleep. You will look like hell. But you will remember the weight of your son on your chest long after the perfectly staged portraits have faded from all relevance. And in 25, 30 years, when your daughter graduates from a university and she's sitting where you are, and some random commencement speaker tells her to thank mom and dad, she will not be thinking of your avatar, of the carefully chosen cover photo that obscures the lines in your face and hides the gray in your hair. She will be thinking of you, creased and sweaty, with thinning hair and warts and liver spots and whatever other signs of decay you've got going on by then. So, class of 2019, march up here and claim your degree and give the camera your absolute best smile. But tonight, as you upload that photo, take a moment to check in with your uninstagrammable self and thank them for getting you this far and for taking you the rest of the way. Thank you. Acapella in front of how many people? 20,000, I've been reassured. It's cool. It's totally fine. Uh, I'm going to pick a random key and hope it ends well. I might change it halfway through. Oh, I also, I also sing hymns. It's a, a weird hang-up. I already told you all, I, I'm not a uh, Mormon anymore, but whenever I have to sing in public, I revert to childhood, and this is childhood for me. So you're all going to have that experience. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I Then sing 